All right, well, hello everyone and welcome. My name is David Potter. I'm Director of Marketing here at Luna Innovations and very happy that you're here to join us for today's uh, webinar. Our webinar today is Optical Vibration Measurements Enable New Solutions for Key Monitoring Applications. Uh, before I turn it over to our speakers, I would like to cover a couple of housekeeping items. At the end of our presentation, we'll have a live question and answer session. If you have any questions for our speakers, Todd and Mike, uh, please just submit them anytime during the presentation using the Q&A box available on your webinar control panel. And we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Also, we will be recording today's webinar, uh, and this will be available to you and your colleagues on demand after the conclusion of the webinar. You can look for an email from us with information on accessing, uh, accessing the on-demand recording, as well as a copy of the slides today. Okay, so now I'd like to turn things over to our speakers. Uh, Mike Baez, who's a sensing product manager here at Luna, and Todd Haber, Chief Technology Officer here at Luna Innovations. All right, it's all yours, guys. All right, thank you, David. Uh, welcome to Luna's webinar about how our optical vibration measurement capabilities are enabling new solutions and monitoring applications. Uh, first, we'll talk a little bit about Luna Innovations as a whole. Um, Luna Innovations is enabling the future with fiber, Founded in 1990 with a worldwide presence, uh, publicly traded on the NASDAQ, Luna is a proven leader in measurement solutions for several markets to include aerospace, automotive, infrastructure, safety, and security, as well as process control. In our endeavor to live our mission every day, we have two separate product offerings, but today we will focus our sense on our sensing solutions and specifically the enhancement of safety and security of infrastructure and perimeters. Uh, as David mentioned, uh, I'm Mike Baez, I'm a sensing product manager and Todd Haver is the CTO of the Lightwave division. Um, so just to get a bit of foundational information about the, um, the field about fiber optic sensing, uh, making these measurements with light, I'd like to kind of talk about um, the, the the ability to make these measurements um, uh, outside of the traditional measurements. Um, so traditional sensors, which most people are familiar with, require a copper line to each sensor and require separate modules for different physical parameter measurements. Uh, fiber optics, on the other hand, can have multiple parameter measurements on the same fiber. Oftentimes this leads to reduced cost to instrument, reduced installation time, as well as simplicity in the cabling. Uh, so first we need to answer some fundamental questions like what is light? Uh, first, uh, so uh, electromagnetic radiation in the form of electromagnetic wave, magnetic waves, um, these waves are measured in optical fiber to allow for measurement parameters to be derived for sensing purposes. Um, these measurements of light can be represented in amplitude, phase, or in wavelength. Um, and these fiber sensors themselves uh, come in a few different forms. Um, you can see that we have single point sensors, uh, which were traditionally Fabry-Perot sensors or single fiber grad gratings, um, or distributed sensors um, that can fit into these two bins in multiplex, quasi-distributed, or fully distributed. Fiber grad grating measurements, um, as well as now Fabry-Perot accelerometers due to the um, advances in technology that Luna has been able to perpetuate. Um, continuous sensing <clears throat> along a fully distributed fiber uh, via Rayleigh, Raman, or Brillion systems. So the five uh, ways that fiber optics um, is oftentimes the only way to make these four types of measurements um, in these areas. Um, EMI immunity, passive sensors that require uh, no power at the sensor, um, inert sensors that are chemically resistant, lend themselves well to harsh environments, and the ability to, to multiplex sensors along the single, over a single fiber, um, over long cable runs simplifies installation and reduce costs, um, as well as the need for embedded applications where um, small low profile sensors are required um, in environments where um, um, embedded <coughs> applications are required. Okay, thanks Mike. Uh, this is Todd with that background on um, an introduction into optical measurements. 
uh, in the motivations, we want to talk about three methods that Luna employs uh, in making optical measurements uh, that will give us context for our vibration measurements discussion today. The first of those three methods is a fiber bracket grating. Um, it's a very simple sensor you see here in a, in a basic connectorized piece of fiber in between the two black marks on that fiber is actually where the FBG resides. Um, the fiber bright gratings are actually a derivative uh, from work done by a father-son physicist pair uh, in the UK, um, the, the Bragg family, uh, in, in their work in analyzing crystal structures by means of x-rays and seeing um, uh, these types of interferences. Um, they actually won the Nobel Prize for this work. <clears throat> The way that these um, Bragg reflectors are realized in optical fiber, there are a number of techniques, uh, one of which is through interfering multiple lasers that will actually create a periodic perturbation in the core uh, of an optical fiber itself. So you wind up with a discrete sensing element uh, within the optical fiber. Uh, this diagram shows that with a broadband light source uh, incident on that device, one wavelength or one color of light will be reflected while uh, the rest of the light will, will continue down the fiber. Uh, it is in this way with different periodicities that reflect different colors that we can get spatial multiplexing uh, for that quasi-distributed um, sensing architecture that Mike talked about. And these discrete sensing elements in the fiber are uh, natively responsive to, to both strain, uh, delta L over L, as well as the change in temperature. So this is one of the fundamental sensing technologies that Luna employs for, for, um, for optical sensing. <clears throat> the second method that's employed is based upon Rayleigh scattering. Uh, so Lord Rayleigh, I believe also a British physicist, uh, also won the Nobel Prize for his work, uh, generating effectively a bunch of confusing math that you can see on the top right. Uh, I think his real claim to fame is answering the question, why is the sky blue? Uh, but underneath uh, all of that insight is the core of the technology used for fully distributed sensing. So Rayleigh scatter um, reflects light from an optical fiber, much like a Bragg grating. But instead of a, a uh, deliberate inscription of a periodicity, um, the random vibrate or the random um, um, imperfections in the fiber act as a reflector that causes light to be reflected um, along the entire length of an optical fiber. Um, those naturally occurring period, periodic changes stretch or respond to temperature in the same way that a fiber bright grating does. And so in the end, what we wind up with is a very similar pattern of response to temperature and strain, but rather than looking at a single um, reflected wavelength, we look at the entire spectrum, but you can see that down the entire length of an optical fiber. So uh, same sort of benefits of strain and temperature response, um, but with a continuous multiplexing. So that's really technology uh, number two. Um, technology number three that we want to discuss and then focus on today is a fabry perot interferometer. Uh, this was also invented by a pair of physicists, uh, French physicists in this case, and it's a very important uh, work um, in physics, optics, and others, the fabry perot interferometer. Uh, unfortunately, these two gentlemen did not win a Nobel Prize for their work, um, but uh, at least one of them shows credit for the discovery of the ozone layer. So that's a, that's a pretty good claim to fame. The way a fabric perot interferometer works is there are two parallel reflectors um, set at a certain distance between them. And much like you would have with a musical instrument or other, other things, the size of that cavity lends to a specific resonance. Uh, in the case of a fabric perot uh, sensor, uh, by changing the length um, of that resonator, you change the frequencies at which uh, that device will resonate. Um, and so that results in um, a spectrum that has multiple periodicities, multiple resonance points for a single device. So uh, remember with the fiber bright grading, there was a single peak for a measurement point. Here there are nearly infinite peaks, uh, theoretically infinite peaks for a single measurement point. Why, why is this architecture of benefit? Uh, if you look at the diagram on the left, you can see that there is a fixed mirror uh, and a moving mirror. And those things can be completely mechanically decoupled from the optical fiber, um, allowing us to carry forward the benefits of sensing in fiber with a flexibility of designing sensors that have a mechanical response for a sensitivity or a time response uh, that may be different from that of a, a core optical fiber on its own. 
So in other words, uh, when we're wanting to look at a sensor like an accelerometer, um, the response to acceleration is not limited by the stiffness or strain limits in an optical fiber. So this really opens up a lot of uh, possibility uh, for, um, for different types of sensing. Uh, the one we'll focus on today is acceleration, but it does come at a penalty uh, in that there are um, theoretically infinite peaks for a single sensor. So uh, left, um, left in its natural state, that would reduce the ability to multiplex on fibers and reduce the overall sensor count that could be incorporated into a system. Um, so um, in the Luna accelerometer, uh, this issue is addressed by the incorporation of WDM filters directly into a sensor package. On the diagram on the, on the left, you can see what two spectra would look like for two optical accelerometers uh, in the inset, both extending over a full uh, available wavelength range from, from measurement instrumentation. Um, but then uh, the, directly to the right of that inset in blue, you see what two filtered serially multiplexed sensors look like in spectrum. So they'll occupy about 20 nanometers of spectrum each. Uh, and then in the center graph in black, you can see what eight multiplexed accelerometer sensors look like together. So this, this uh, inclusion of a WDM package into the sensor uh, allows us to benefit from the mechanical decoupling, uh, giving us the opportunity for good time response and sensitivity. Um, while restoring the capabilities intrinsic to fiber bag ratings for serial multiplexing. So um, these technologies fold into a package component that you see on this slide uh, and a resulting performance that is thousands of times more sensitive than other fiber accelerometers. Um, also with the benefit of moving mechanical resonances out beyond ranges that we need to measure uh, and dramatically increasing sensitivity in the sensor. And, um, and it is with those capabilities uh, that, that, um, that we approach some of the applications that we'll talk about uh, in the remainder of this presentation. Yeah, so you know, we need to answer this, you know, what's driving this technology? Um, and, and really it is the need for these large scale, ruggedly, or ru environmentally rugged, um, sensitive devices um, that can be used for rapid response. Um, and, and again, being able to, to make this information actionable. And you can see a few of these represent, uh, representative applications here on the screen. Um, we'll focus on a few of these um, throughout the duration of this presentation. So yeah, before we move on from this slide, Mike, I want to draw attention um, to, to, to maybe one or more of these. Um, you can, see, um, you can see some security implications from vibration measurements, uh, perhaps some machine monitoring in the form of wind turbines, uh, perhaps some access control or even um, uh, malicious tampering within uh, high value data assets. The one on the right, uh, those, two, those two pictures um, show an application of, uh, of one, of the, one of the needs that we'll focus on. These are post-tension concrete structures, so essentially very large concrete um, be it bridges or, uh, or overpasses or, or what have you that are, that are strengthened by the use of post-tension um, steel wires and steel braids. And that's what you see on the inside of the, of the, of the photo on the right. Each one of these um, wires um, is held in tension that causes a, uh, a compression on the concrete. And one of, the, one of the applications we'll talk about is monitoring those for any sort of um, corrosion-driven degradation or, or breakage events. Yeah, and, and you know, another question that we need to answer um, is how does this compare to a traditional accelerometer? Um, you know, we have distances of 100 meters, about 100 meters without com complex accessories. Um, and with the Luna's optical version, the OS7500 Fabry Pro accelerometer, and we can have these sensors thousands of meters away from the data acquisition system. Um, with a traditional accelerometer, um, we're looking at single sensors per copper cable or, or twisted pair. Um, up to eight sensors can be put on a single fiber, up to 128 of these accelerometers on a single data acquisition unit. Connected to a single multi-fiber cable. Correct. Um, you know, thus um, instituting cost savings across projects. 
Um, so, you know, traditional accelerometers have a single parameter measurement capability. Um, with these uh, accelerometers, they can be paired with strain gauges, temperature sensors, displacement gauges, inclinometers, um, so on and so forth, um, that are optically based and commercially available today. Um, these sensors are also passive, lightweight, EMI immune, intrinsically safe to be used um, in environments um, that where there is uh, hazards of ignition, uh, things of that sort, ATEX requirements uh, that may dictate. Uh, flexible interconnections and routing, uh, also with inexpensive cabling. Um, again, we, you know, we kind of go back to, it, to what we talked about before and the ability to serially multiplex across these um, allows for a much more robust sensing uh, or cabling um, uh, infrastructure. Um, so these simple vibration measurements um, can be had over hundreds of points on a single data acquisition system. But there are places where the OS7500 Fabry Pro accelerometer might not be the right fit. Uh, so input frequencies over a kilohertz um, or uh, single sensor deployments, it, it just doesn't really make sense in that way. Um, so, you know, we have um, uh, on the screen here, uh, we support uh, FBG and Fabry Pro sensing on this uh, Hyperion interrogator that you see. Um, we also offer strain, temperature, acceleration, and displacement measurements um, that can be paired with that. Um, and then we wrap all of that up in a software uh, that we call Inlay. Uh, we will see a demonstration of the software, but you know, and in this chart below, uh, you'll see that there are, you know, that these sensors themselves don't necessarily need to be segregated on a, onto a particular channel. Uh, you can have strain gauges, you can have temperature sensors and displacement gauges on the same channels um, with one another. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how we can go about using Fabry Pro accelerometers uh, with the instrumentation in the software. So this slide depicts uh, a 2D plane where we have placed three uh, Fabry Pro accelerometers uh, at various distances from each other, uh, anywhere from two meters to 10 meters apart. Um, and, uh, and we create an impact event uh, using a spring-loaded center punch over a concrete structure in between those. Um, you can imagine that um, this will create an acoustic wave that propagates from that center punch out to each of those sensors uh, in direction. And as we capture the vibration events from those three sensors uh, simultaneously on a Hyperion interrogator, uh, they will arrive due to the time of flight, uh, the, the speed of sound through the media at those sensors at different times. And based upon when those um, events are detected, uh, we can actually calculate uh, within, um, within about 1% accuracy over the distance um, where that event took place. And to show a demo here um, of, of how that works, uh, we have a, a setup from a, from a previous trade conference. Uh, this is about a 15 foot um, piece of uh, PVC pipe that is uh, collapsed into an, an S uh, shape. Um, and on the, the, the top end closest to you, you'll see uh, this one of those optical accelerometers mounted uh, to the end. Uh, on the far end towards the, the booth, you'll see another um, uh, gold colored accelerometer. So these are mounted on either end of this 15 foot pipe. Uh, and then in a data acquisition software, um, there are seven sections uh, that have been identified um, by the phase shift uh, that is likely to be seen by those two sensors from an impact event. So you can imagine if we were to tap this pipe directly in the center, um, that, um, that vibration would travel down the length of the pipe, equal lengths of pipe, and arrive at those sensors at the same time. If we were to tap the pipe closest to the top sensor, its signal would lead uh, the other sensor by a significant degree. And so by taking those expected uh, lead lag by the speed of sound in the pipe, and mapping those to different sections. Um, this demo maps the, uh, that phase shift to a musical note that will be reproduced so that you can see, um, you can see this uh, location detection capability. Okay, so that's a, that's a, um, a view of our Enlight software showing those uh, um, two FBG or sorry, those two Fabry Pro accelerometers uh, receiving each of those signals in, in succession. 
And then of course the data processing, uh, unwrapping that phase shift and mapping that to um, a location for those events. Uh, here, the location alert was a different tone. Okay, so uh, what are some other ways that we can go about using these sensors? Um, we're gonna show a couple slides here uh, where the same two accelerometers are buried in soil and are, uh, the signals are being acquired by the same Hyperion interrogator. Uh, and different ways of using these sensors are facilitated by different um, data processing on the time um, series streams of acceleration data from the two accelerometers. A first application um, uh, was indicated in a previous slide about detecting footsteps. Uh, here you can see a gentleman walking by these buried sensors and through a very, very simple algorithm um, of effectively just looking um, uh, at a threshold of the amplitude of the detected acceleration, uh, you, can, you can clearly see in the inset on the right uh, three step events as he approaches, steps near, and then walks away from uh, those sensors. So this is one way that it could be used um, to detect intruders uh, as part of a, a linear detection system. Uh, these same two sensors, were, while buried in soil, um, are actually able to detect vibrations from overhead aircraft. Um, uh, these happen to be near a local municipal airport, um, which is a, a really great way to simulate what, um, what a border monitoring system might be interested in, which is in low flying aircraft. Um, I think often a technique to evade radar <laughs> is, is to fly close to the ground, which puts um, the, the target detected aircraft within range of sensors like these safely buried underneath the soil. So taking this, that same time series data from these two accelerometers and running it through an FFT algorithm and then plotting the frequency domain over time, you can actually see um, the, uh, the overtones of that propeller um, uh, noise profile, as well as an indication of uh, the change in frequency uh, showing us the Doppler shift. Uh, so you can imagine with a, with a pair of these sensors uh, or three sensors in a plane, uh, being able to detect not only uh, the frequency signatures of an aircraft, um, but also the relative um, changes in the Doppler shift would allow you to deduce even direction, uh, as well as potentially identify the type of aircraft that you're hearing. Okay, in a third example, uh, with these same two sensors, uh, we happen to have these, these sensors uh, buried in monitoring, um, what, about a year? A year ago when, uh, when there was an earthquake, uh, the Ridgecrest earthquake in California. Um, and so these sensors were, were buried in Atlanta, Georgia, so pretty much across the entirety of the United States. Um, and the raw signals that were recorded by these two sensors can be seen in the left inset uh, as the orange and blue data. Now it would be very fair to say that, um, that we don't have a lot of signal to noise there uh, based upon um, um, just the, the, the raw detection of the data. Uh, but the algorithms that were applied here were actually looking at a cross correlation between those two sensors. Uh, that's the graph from the bottom right. Um, so you can see that for most of that period, it was uh, really just random uncorrelated noise, um, not drawing our attention for any additional processing. Uh, but about two thirds through that plot, you'll see a high degree of cross correlation um, that allows us to focus in and run an extended degree of averaging, actually about 10 seconds of averaging on this data and we're able to then pull out um, the, the waveforms 800 seconds after the, uh, the earthquake erupted, uh, what we measured across the country as those waves actually traveled across the country. So here we see the sensitivity of the, as well as the flexibility of the accelerometer system. Um, and interestingly, if we compare what we measured against what the uh, uh, US Geological Survey measured in a monitor, dedicated monitoring station in Tennessee, um, there's a very, very high degree of correlation in how that event was received and detected. So really that's, uh, that's, that's three different methods that we talked about using the same sensors. Uh, and really just the difference here is the way that, um, that the data has been processed. Uh, so to talk a bit more about applications, you know, a great use of this technology has been the 
2019 deployment of three interrogators and 153 fabric borough accelerometers to measure and monitor an elevated rail system that is a post-tension structure for wire breaks. The monitoring of, this, of these wire breaks has been enabled by the sensitivity of the fabric pro accelerometer. And we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, application after the live demo to provide a bit of context. Yeah, so in, in addition to, um, or I suppose while, while monitoring for wire breaks, we have to be aware in this particular application that there may be other sources of noise, uh, such as uh, live passing trains. And what we're seeing in the top left plot here um, is, is a, uh, um, a graphic of the uh, energy received by the accelerometers as a function of frequency in the y-axis, as a function of time in the x-axis. Um, the vertical lines that you see there are simulated um, wire break events, uh, again done with a, um, uh, what's called a Schmidt hammer, which is uh, like a, like a spring-loaded center punch, uh, in that, that, that white mass that we see in the lower frequencies is actually um, that is the, the presence of a passing train and the vibrations that were detected by the accelerometer. So to first order, it's very easy to see um, visually where those detected events were. Um, and, and further, the accelerations were monitored by the optical accelerometer. When that data was received and stored, it can actually be converted uh, to an audio file and played back. So what I'm going to play now um, is an audio reproduction of the wire break events as well as the passing train um, as recorded by the optical fabric pro accelerometer. Okay, so it's, it's very clear there, uh, even with your ears or your eyes or um, naturally follows through, through some um, uh, detection algorithm um, that, that these detection events can be, can be uh, or these wire breaks can be detected in the presence of noise. Uh, the plot on the bottom is just a further uh, filtering um, that allows for a very easy threshold detection to identify where those events were. Um, as an added bonus, while we were monitoring for uh, detection events, um, uh, one of the local engineers noted that we had captured a, um, what's called a wheel hammer event. So that's a flat spot on, on a wheel on a train. And you can see that as broad spectrum periodic noise uh, that uh, correlates directly with the diameter of the wheel uh, and the rate at which the train was traveling. Uh, so it's really additional benefit um, that can be derived from, a, from an instrumented structure uh, in terms of monitoring health of the, uh, of the assets that travel over it. Okay, so um, with that, uh, we would actually like to show you live um, the use of one of these sensors using our Hyperion interrogator uh, in our NLight software. Okay, what we're looking at right now is the acquisition tab of the Enlight software. It is connected to a five kilohertz interrogator, uh, as you can see in the, um, in the status bar on the top. And we're looking at the live spectrum of one of these WDM filtered um, Fabry Pro accelerometers. So the, uh, the instrument detects uh, the spectrum. It also detects um, the characteristic peaks. We said they were repeated peaks that are now filtered down to just um, you know, six or seven instead of, instead of hundreds. And the instrument actually exports um, a value, a calibrated value for that accelerometer, which we declare here in our software as a sensor. And we can declare minimum and maximum thresholds um, um, and, uh, and warning limits for that sensor prior to uh, perhaps displaying that sensor on an image. So in this case, we would see what the uh, what the current value was for that sensor, as well as on a charting image here, okay? So this is the response of an accelerometer mapped against uh, the limits that we just set uh, in our configuration um, as a function of time. Now you may notice a uh, correlation in the detected signal um, with my voice. We actually have one of these accelerometers um, sitting in a lab with a host, uh, or sorry, one of, one of the guests for this uh, presentation. So it's the accelerometer is attending the same presentation that you guys are. Uh, and we're doing that in order to give a demonstration on how to use the sensor, capture the data, uh, and then consume that data. So within the Enlight software, uh, we have the option to configure different types of data saving uh, and distribute that data uh, when the conditions for saving and distribution have been met. 
Uh, you can directly FTP files um, and pull those into other applications over the web. Or uh, as we will do in this demo, you can create um, uh, target email addresses. So we've, we've set up a data save configuration here that's going to be triggered um, when we achieve either a warning or an alarm limit. And it's gonna continue to save data for the duration of that event um, until one second after the event ends, okay? So I'm going to go, you will see at the top of the save box, a pause button in blue when it's ready to record and you'll see it say, uh, change to a check box while it's recording. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. I will be quiet uh, until it's time to trigger. Okay, so now we're triggering our data save with my voice. You see that it changed from a pause to a checkbox. And now I trigger it again and we say one, two, three. Okay, so now that we have captured that information, uh, we can come over into my uh, email browser here. And you can see that those files have shown up. Um, we can preview what a data file looks like. Uh, so this is what was just recorded with all the time series of data. Um, and then you can also just go back and replay uh, any of the files that were saved. I'll save a little time here. We're not going to go through the download process. Okay, so that is, um, let's see, this, this file will convert that over to a, a WAV file if, if we would like to distribute. But what you can see here is, is the sensitivity, the time response uh, of the sensor, um, and then the, the ease with which you can, uh, you can consume and process that data. So with that additional context, it's easy to see why the fabric pro accelerometer was selected from a technology perspective. But what about from a cost perspective? How does it stack up? Uh, with the solution capable of measuring 900% further than traditional acoustic emissions technologies, there was no longer a need for multiple data acquisition nodes that would have been required in the traditional setup. The installation and material costs were also cut um, due to the simplicity in cabling, um, as well as the reduction in need for uh, redundant cabling bundles. Um, the installation costs themselves were reduced because there was not needs for multiple trips back and forth through the cantilevered beam structure. Um, accelerometers also, um, you know, as, from a technology perspective, uh, were EMI immune um, at, due to the fact that the stray voltage from the metro rail running over the system would have uh, caused washouts in the uh, traditional acoustical acoustic emission sensors. Uh, so another application you've, you've likely heard of um, is the Mirandi Bridge that failed in, Geneo, in Genoa, uh, Italy several years ago. In order to ensure a tragedy like this never happens again, an active measurement of the, the modes of the bridge was required by the bridge owner. The modal analysis measurement system is using these highly sensitive accelerometers to better understand the modality of the bridge and to better understand when and if uh, intervention is required. Um, two interrogators were utilized to measure 55 uh, Fabry-Pro accelerometers. Um, these were selected because of the sensitivity of the accelerometers themselves. Um, but in addition to uh, the need to pair with strain and in, uh, inclinometers um, measurements uh, to bring the total cost of instrumentation down, as well as the total cost uh, of the project down by way of, um, of installation itself. And just for a point of clarity, uh, on this bridge, unlike the, uh, the previous example, the measurement method is not for instantaneous high-speed detection events. Uh, rather, the strength of these sensors and their sensitivity and low frequency response and accuracy and low frequency response is what's being utilized here. Effectively, um, these 55 accelerometers are being distributed around the length of the bridge and the slow sway, the slow variation in the bridge and its natural response to traffic, its natural response to bridge uh, wind are being used uh, to monitor its own resonant frequency. If there are any changes in the resonant frequency of the structure at any point, really even down to probably the hundredth of a hertz, that's indicative of some sort of a mechanical change in the structure. 
So though this is a similar application, it's really a very different utilization of the accelerometer system. Uh, lastly, a German consortium called DFWIN uh, deployed many of these fabric furrow accelerometers for the validation of structural behaviors of, of several wind turbines in a single instrument, measuring 32 accelerometers in a two-axis configuration. The simplicity in cabling and requirement for EMI immunity made the OS7500 fabric furrow accelerometer the obvious choice for condition-based monitoring. Um, these systems are deployed currently um, and are obviously operating in an extremely harsh environment today. Uh, so in summary, um, we've talked about optical sensing, the technologies associated with optical sensing uh, that Luna provides, the motivations for the development of a, this FabriPro accelerometer, um, as well as the operation um, and capabilities um, that, that, are, that are associated with the sensor. Um, we talked through a couple of applications examples, um, and obviously there's uh, plenty of questions that I'm sure have come around from this, uh, so I'll let uh, David facilitate um, those questions, but um, if you ever need to contact us or have questions about this technology, our contact information um, is located at the bottom of the slide here. Great. Thank you, Todd and Mike. That was, that was great. Okay, so as, as Mike mentioned, we'll go ahead and answer some questions now. Again, uh, if you have additional questions, please submit them using the Q&A box on your control panel. And also, as, as you do that, a reminder again that we, uh, we will distribute uh, a recording. We'll send an email with information on accessing a recording of the webinar. And we'll also include any questions that uh, we're not able to get to. We'll either answer those directly or include those on a Q&A transcript that we'll distribute as well. Okay, so looks like we've got some good questions coming in. All right, so um, there were a couple filter the end series uh, question. Could you elaborate on, on how it's used uh, to do that filtering? And then there's another use, to, use for multiplexing seems to occupy a much greater bandwidth than 20 nanometers than, the re, than required to measure the wavelength shift. Is it possible to reduce this bandwidth, for instance, if we have a predefined acceleration amplitude range that we went to moder, we wouldn't need the full 20 nanometers. David, um, I, I think there were two questions. I definitely uh, understood the question about the, um, the wavelength range. Uh, first question, uh, the audio was breaking up a little bit about filtering. Okay. Sorry, yeah, the first question was really just generally, can you elaborate on how the WDM filter is used to filter uh, the sensors? Sure. Um, yeah, those, those filters are, are integrated filters that are built into the accelerometer itself. Uh, the intention is for it effectively to work like a, um, um, a multiplexable FBG. So if you have broad spectrum incident light, um, a 20 nanometer window is going to be directed towards the, uh, the Edelon inside of that single device, while the other 140 nanometers are sent out of the device um, downstream for, for subsequent um, accelerometers. Um, to, to the second question, um, the 20 nanometers, um, quite frankly, are commercially available CWD amps um, that have been used on, on this, our first generation of accelerometer device. Uh, it, is, it is absolutely feasible to reduce that width from a design perspective. Um, it is built into the device, um, so it's not something that can be changed by user choice. Um, but we are, we are uh, actively exploring um, components that will allow us to reduce that width uh, probably down to 10 nanometers at first, doubling the capacity. Uh, and with that, um, you know, we, our, our algorithms and sensitivity um, uh, can be maintained to deliver the same results we discussed today. Okay, uh, there's a few questions about the dynamic response of the sensor. What limits a dynamic response to kilohertz? And then uh, related to that, would it be possible to extend the frequency range uh, above that? Yeah, so uh, joining us here to help uh, answer some of the more technical questions is uh, Justin Stay. He's our director of product development um, for the uh, 
uh, engineering group here in Atlanta. Morning. <clears throat> yeah, I was trying to keep up and answering a couple of these questions in the background, uh, but they just kept coming. So, hmm. um, yeah, there, there are two things that uh, limit our dynamic response. Certainly the first, like any accelerometer, is the combination of the proof mass and, and the spring constant of, of the accelerometer. That really dictates the resonant frequency of the sensor itself. Typically, you like to keep in a linear regime um, an accelerometer. So, um, you know, if, if the resonant frequency, for instance, on our 7510s, are, it's about 2400 hertz. Um, the, the best linear regime is probably about 0 to 350 hertz. Uh, having said that, um, knowing that that mechanical resonance exists, there's nothing to say that you couldn't uh, excite the sensor out to um, its resonant frequency. Uh, the second thing that limits the dynamic response is the actual uh, acquisition rate of the instrument itself. Part of the way we use these sensors is we have to track those Fabry Pro valleys um, in order to uh, avoid aliasing um, that tracking algorithm. We have to make sure we are updating and, and tracking those in time. Um, so you'll see in the data sheet there is a frequency dependent maximum excitation for each, each sensor. Uh, and you see that is a, um, a reducing value as, as frequency increases. So, and future variants of the Hyperion instrument, um, as we scan faster, our dynamic response will, will naturally increase. Okay, great. Um, and, and what is the lowest range of frequencies that these accelerometers can detect? Yeah, because these do have some temperature um, sensitivity, uh, these aren't appropriate for absolute or, or DC measurements. However, having said that, we have, um, uh, uh, with some um, collaboration with NIST, have shown good uh, 0.1 hertz response. Um, these accelerometers coupled with our data we've taken on, on capturing a California earthquake here, which had periods on the order of about 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Um, yeah, we're, we're confident in, in, in a linear response um, down to almost DC. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned temperature. There's a question. Uh, is the Fabry Pro sensor response sensitive to other parameters such as temperature, humidity, et cetera? Yes, it is. And if you look at the data sheet, we do uh, uh, specify that. I, I tend to use these sensors where I, I um, remove uh, a, a long averaging DC offset uh, so that we're only looking at the uh, dynamic response. And that was actually something that um, <clears throat> was in the setup here under the sensor itself. So you can see in the expression, we're consuming the, uh, the live acceleration. And then we're also uh, subtracting off a filtered response of that acceleration. That filtered response effectively is, um, um, is the, the thermal response. Uh, so by, by doing that, we can make ourselves immune to any sort of temperature variations uh, in the response of the sensor and keep it uh, centered in a, in a detection window. Got it. Uh, what's the sampling rate of the interrogator? Uh, he noticed a lack of frequencies in the recording. Yeah, so the, the, um, the acquisition rate of the interrogator is five kilohertz. Um, what, you're, what you're more likely experiencing is, is the, uh, uh, the response roll off of the, the sensor itself, as well as probably something in the, the, uh, the the coupling uh, of the sound source into the um, into the sensor itself. Um, that is a that is a seventy five twenty sensor. Yeah, seventy five twenty is a um, over damp sensor with a resonance frequency of about three hundred and fifty hertz. What we're seeing is is really low low frequency um, um, excitations of our voice. But of the two, it's the higher sensitivity model. Okay, excellent. Uh, I had a couple questions about measuring pump vibration. So are these accelerometers suited for measuring pump vibrations? Um, and then kind of elaborates on this. Would I need three accelerometers to measure vibrations in three different axes, leaving only five sensors on a, on a fiber? That, that is correct. Um, so each of these sensors itself is a single axis accelerometer. Um, so, you know, in order to, to make a three axis measurement, you would, you would consume 
uh, 60 nanometers of that of that wavelength range. Yeah, with the um, appropriateness, respect to the appropriateness of the um, measuring the pump actuators, um, if you go to our website uh, and look for a data sheet for the OS7500, you'll see there are two different models, the OS7510, the OS7520. Uh, those those uh, describe what the input range of accelerations are, as well as the frequency range. Um, again, if, if data acquisitions, uh, five kilohertz or less, are appropriate with the um, with the sensitivity and acceleration ranges of those devices, um, then it could well well be a solution. Okay, uh, can is a question. Can we use our own Fabry Pro sensors? Um, yeah, a little little outside of the scope of uh, of this presentation, but if we were to speak about the uh, Hyperion itself, um, absolutely. Um, the Hyperion is, is uh, really agnostic uh, with respect to what type of sensor is, is plugged in. Its job is to acquire spectrum over um, any device, any reflective uh, or transmissive device in, in use with a circulator, um, and to rapidly derive um, features from that, um, from that high-speed spectrum. Uh, the onboard detection um, algorithms are optimized for peaks or valleys. Uh, so uh, you could, on a Fabry Pro device, consume a high-speed array of valleys from a Fabry Pro of your own uh, design. Um, then um, converting those peaks and valleys uh, into your measure and um, uh, would, would happen offline. Um, in the case of our particular device, um, that tracking um, and the bookkeeping um, that gives us really an extended dynamic range. While you only see maybe seven um, peaks inside of that window, we're not actually restricted to those seven peaks. Through an index tracking algorithm inside the Hyperion for the OS7500, um, over subsequent scans, we can, we can go many free spectral ranges, which gives us a very wide measurement range. Um, if you were to use your own Fabry Pro sensor, um, that type of algorithm will be left for outside code. All right. Uh, here's a question. How fragile are the optic fiber cabling installations in comparison to regular copper cables you know, used with non-optical sensors? Yeah, I think, um, you know, optical cabling has come a long way in the last 30, 40 years. It's, it's installed every day by, um, by a technician in the field. Um, we sell these sensors with a, a robust tactical cable. Uh, companies like Corning and AFL offer similar backbones that have one to 32 to 64 individual fibers. So I, I think in general, um, optical cable can be considered just as robust as copper, copper cable. It, it really kind of depends on what, what is surrounded it, surrounding it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, how about uh, someone asked if you can discuss any sensing applications for pipelines? And related soil movement. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of interest in using these accelerometers and, and pipeline monitoring applications. Um, uh, you know, even even detecting leakage events with the acoustic response of the sensors. Um, what would, what we showed you on our PVC pipe uh, certainly applies. Uh, if there if there are impact events, uh, if there are discrete events um, where multiple sensors can be used to locate those events, these accelerometers bring quite a bit of advantage. Uh, there's no need to have a continuous mounting of a fiber like you might have with other continuous distributed vibration detection technologies. Um, uh, there are some real limitations in what can be mounted and where on pipes. Um, and if you can't mount it on the pipe and you have to mount it in adjacent soil, having the burden of continuously trenching and, and, and varying continuous lengths of sensing fiber uh, can dramatically increase the cost. These being quasi-distributed sensors, uh, you can place them discreetly in convenient places uh, and then basically just run connecting cable uh, between the two in whatever way is most economical or, uh, or uh, convenient um, uh, or most secure in terms of uh, protecting the cabling itself. Um, Mike, did you have anything else to add? Yeah, I think, you know, even to, to expand on that for, for security applications or places where um, utilizing a star network is advantageous, there it represents an, an obvious cost savings in being able to, to route appropriate uh, in, a, in a more advantageous manner. 
Further, um, these Hyperion interrogators have been used with large networks of strain sensors to actually monitor and measure deflection of pipelines, um, which are a direct measurement of soil movement on the impact of, of, the, uh, of the pipeline. So kind of back to Mike's point about this being um, part of a multi-parameter detection system, uh, combinations of vibrations, the potential for leakage detections or tampering events within a fiber, or sorry, within a pipeline, the location detection capabilities of the accelerometers can be combined with large numbers of direct strain measurements on pipelines to, uh, to monitor for deformation. Excellent, yeah, and there's, there's a question or two of, about how, how do you combine or multiplex the Fabry Perot accelerometers with FBG sensors? Uh, is that on the same fiber or, or how does that work? Yeah, so, um, uh, the, the FBG sensors uh, of the different varieties, the strain, the displacement, the temperature sensors, all of those can be mixed um, on a single fiber, um, provided that they can, they can use a common peak detection uh, algorithm, which is typically the case. Um, from, from any single vendor, including Luna, you'll see a lot of commonality uh, in the FBGs that are used, say quarter nanometer, 3 dB widths. Uh, with that, you can blend temperature, strain, displacement sensors all on a, on a single channel. Um, the high period uses a separate channel and a separate detection algorithm for the accelerometer sensors, um, but you can blend multiple fibers and multiple sensor types across an instrument. So for example, you could have strain temperature displacement on channels one, two, three, and five, and, um, and accelerometers on channels four, six, seven, and eight on an eight channel unit in any combination you want of those mm -hmm. channels. And the, in, in the, um, by utilizing all of those channels, you're not necessarily reducing your capability or your ability to measure many sensors along a single fiber. These are all, this is all parallel detection. Uh, okay, excellent. Um, so yes, yeah, someone asks on the applications, how about using it to find uh, cracks in a concrete bridge? So, yeah, that's something we have, um, we've typically done uh, more with either displacement sensors uh, in, in areas of, of key interest or, or frankly with our uh, continuous distributed strain sensors with the Rayleigh backscatter. That's an, an excellent method to find, um, um, uh, you know, large strain gradients uh, like an emerging crack in areas where you don't know a priori where you may be looking for, for, for those types of, um, of, um, of things to happen. Um, whether or not the accelerometer could use, I suppose that's really dependent on the, uh, the acoustic profile of that crack generation and propagation. Um, I'm not sure that's something that we have um, a lot of experience with directly. Okay. Uh, all right, let me take a couple more. We're getting close to the end of the hour here. Uh, can the sensor still function without casing, more like a bare sensor? I need to embed it into a synthetic material. Interesting question. <laughs> Justin, what do you think? Yeah, uh, I'm assuming maybe you might be confusing a little bit about our Rayleigh backscatter instruments. So this, this sensor is already in a package and it can be used as such. We do have a number of um, installation uh, recommendations and, and procedures to make that even more robust, um, both increasing um, um, influence to water ingress. Um, but yeah, you, you don't have to uh, necessarily encase this in something. Yeah, the, the accelerometer itself uh, is a packaged component. Uh, there are some um, some bulk components in, inside of it. It is, um, um, in terms of overall dimensions, um, it's about 43 millimeters by 14 millimeters by 12.6 millimeters. So it's not really the, the sensor one would choose to embed uh, necessarily, as, as, uh, as Justin said, we do have the other technologies that are uh, direct fiber measurements um, and using the Rayleigh backscatter, that is a very um, um, common and successful use of the fiber to embed directly into either additive uh, manufacturing processes, uh, composite layers, or, or other things. This component is, is, uh, is typically surface mounted onto structures. Okay. Yeah, I think this builds on an answer you already gave, but uh came in a couple different forms. Can the Hyperion SI-255 interrogator monitor FBGs, long period gratings, Fabry-Perot, and Max Ender interferometers 
simultaneously. Absolutely. Yes to all those things. Uh, the fiber by grading sets, again, your choice is going to be on the detection algorithm you choose on a per channel basis. Um, so anything that you can regard as a quarter nanometer plus or minus, you know, maybe 20% uh, peak, uh, you can put on a single channel. Uh, anything you'd have to monitor as a valley um, with, with the same sort of uh, parameters you'd put on a different channel. So in that example, I would imagine you, you would measure FPGs on a single channel. A long period grading, you might be looking at, you know, one um, in transmission, you'd be looking at a very wide, maybe eight, 10 nanometer wide valley. Uh, and you could do that on its channel with, um, with the null detection. Uh, Mox Ender interferometer, you could use peak or valley um, um, and, and choose uh, its detection. So yes, you would, you would be streaming at full speed, five kilohertz on each of those types of sensors concurrently. Excellent. Okay, let's take one more. If, uh, if the sensors are set up in series and one of the sensor fails, do, you, uh, do the other sensors continue being acquired and transmitting to the user? In the case of fiber brag gratings, um, those are bi-directional sensors. Um, and, and we do have some strategies and product and uh, options offerings in the Hyperion for what we call a full redundancy. Uh, effectively, you can use multiple channels to interrogate strings of FBG sensors from either side, such that if there is a break, you can continue to look at, um, at each subset of that array on either side of the break. In the case of these um, uh, FabriPro accelerometers, uh, the inclusion of the CWDM to make them multiplexable makes them intrinsically uh, unidirectional. Okay, very good. All right, so I think we will call it there. Um, there were a few questions we didn't get to. And as I mentioned, we will we'll provide a Q&A transcript and try to get answers to all your questions. Or if it's a more direct question, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll answer it directly. Um, so Todd, Mike, Justin, thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, thank you, David. Thank you, Sarah, for putting this together. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, please do feel free to reach out to any of us uh, directly with any further questions you may have. Really appreciate everybody joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Um, we do appreciate you being here today. Um, take care, and we'll, we'll see you next time. Thank you.